Welcome back to the channel for another bike review. Uh, today I'm joined by Superbike Royalty. This bike is one of the founding fathers of the modern era Superbike. It's a 1998 Yamaha YZF R1. Back in the late 90s, Honda and Ducati were really leading the charge um, in terms of having the fastest and the most desirable superbikes. It really seemed that most of the other manufacturers weren't particularly interested in competing with them at that time. Um, that was until 1998 when Yamaha set loose something that would shake up the entire superbike market, the mighty R1. So many an eyebrow was raised when this bike was released. Um, this simply wasn't a race trimmed Thunder race or a souped up Genesis 750. Instead, Yamaha went right back to basics for this bike. Um, and designed everything from the ground up with one purpose and that purpose was to beat the Honda Fireblade. Uh, Yamaha had no shortage of original ideas um, that they used on this original version of the R1. Things such as the stacked gearbox, uh, this basically means that the uh, the gearbox's main shaft was actually above the crank and was supposed to be in line with it. So the idea of this really was to shorten the actual length of the engine. Um, this would allow for a longer swing arm but to actually shorten the wheelbase giving the bike a more a race oriented stance and allow for harsher acceleration while keeping the front wheel planted on the ground. So back in 1998 this idea was absolutely revolutionary, um, a complete game changer for the industry and that particular configuration is still commonly used even today. Yamaha were also incredibly proud of the fact uh, that the R1 made a claimed 150 brake horsepower. That paired with the 177 kilogram dry weight made this the fastest production bike of its time. Other notable aspects from a design element, um, the brake calipers were all single castings, that was to um, provide additional strength. And my personal favourite, the gear linkage down here, actually passes through a little hole in the frame. Yamaha took the world by storm with this bike back in 1998. Um, it was faster, it was shorter, it was lighter than all of its competition at the time. And I think what's really crazy is statistically this bike is still a force to be reckoned with even almost 25 years after its release. Before we get this bike out on the road and see what it's all about, um, if you've been with us for any amount of time you'll know we work very closely with JD Motors who are based here in the Lake District. This bike is here today courtesy of them so a huge thank you to them as always. They've absolutely pulled it out of the bag with this unbelievably clean example uh, which they have for sale in their showroom. I'll leave the links to their website and social channels in the description of this video. Please do go show them some support as this wouldn't be possible without their help. So this should be quite a, an interesting road test as towards the end of last year um, I did review the 2002 R1 and then the 2004 I think if I remember rightly so that would be the, the two generations to follow this bike. So it will be quite interesting now to ride the original just to draw that comparison between the three bikes one thing you notice from the get-go is just how aggressive everything feels um, obviously this bike is from a time before fuel injection and also before the strict emissions rules came into play that the new bikes have to abide to so the low RPM is quite snatchy just wants to go all the time definitely goes when it wants to as well even by today's standards 25 years on that's seriously seriously quick so just while we're waiting to get going a bit here I will give you a little bit of a background on the bike um, so as I mentioned earlier it's a 1998 model YZFR1 I'm not 100% sure on the story 
Um, but from what I can understand, the, it's a 1998 spec bike, it's a 1998 bike on the document, but it was right on the reg transfer when the 1999 bikes came into place. So there was a choice of stickers that came with the bike when it was new. So the R1 connoisseurs amongst you probably realise that the stickers on the bike aren't what you would expect to see on a 1998 bike. So the YZF is horizontal on the side fairing, whereas on the original 1998 bike, the YZF was vertical running down, um, sort of under the in indicator stalk. Rob, who's the main man up at JD Motors, he did say that both stickers are included with the bike, so when it was new it came with both stickers. So whoever decides to buy the bike can install those 98 stickers if they'd rather. Uh, the bike is around 22,000 miles, I believe. Full service history. It's absolutely immaculate condition. And it is all standard, with the exception of the fork internals. Um, they've been upgraded. It has a Maxton rear shock and spring. And the wheels have been powder coated black. Other than that, completely standard. I'm sure they agree, very tasteful mods. It's quite hard to find a, a bike of this age, particularly a super bike. There's not been molested, it's not covered in shiny parts and obviously back in the day these uh, original spec R1s were insanely popular, hugely popular. As a result there was no shortage of aftermarket parts available for them, which was great at the time but 25 years on if you're looking to buy a bike as a, an investment opportunity, which in my eyes a bike like this should be bought as, it means it's just that little bit harder to find a nice clean example. With the exception of the wheels being black and the upgraded suspension, this bike is exactly as it came from the, the showroom. Some of these early R1s were prone to a, an issue with the gearbox. Uh, between first neutral and second, basically what would happen is under load, if you're accelerating hard, the bike would jump from second back into neutral, so it'd jump out of gear. From my understanding of it, this was only really on bikes that had had a particularly hard life if they'd been abused. I'm pleased to report everything is lovely and tight on this bike. So even though the low RPMs are a bit snatchy and like the clutch feels a little bit heavy at the low speeds, it's, it's still a surprisingly easy bike to ride. Even popping around town like this, and obviously this isn't by any stretch of imagination what it was designed to do. Hopefully we'll get a little opportunity to explore that a little bit shortly. Yeah, really easy to ride, smooth. I think my only criticism, which is a very, very trivial criticism at this point, is the LEDs here, so for neutral main beam indicators um, and the fuel light. The LEDs are naff, like you can barely, barly see them. Probably in, in the evening time or at night time they probably stand out a lot more, but certainly here in daylight, if the indicator light's on or like, the fuel light came on a little bit earlier as I picked the bike up, you can barely, barely see it. Let's not forget the bike is 25 years old. Uh, I mean, to have an LCD display back in 1998 would have been pretty revolutionary on a, on a superbike. It's just more something to be aware of if you're relying on your instruments. Fuel gauges are quite common on modern superbikes now, so to jump on some of these older bikes that don't have a fuel gauge, and then when the fuel light's a bit difficult to see, it's just certainly something to be aware of if you're out riding a bike like this. But other than that, everything is really, really well laid out. Speedometer, nice big LCD with a trip meter. Temperature, easy to read. All the controls, fairly standard. Obviously this bike does have a choke, not being fuel injection. Might be an alien concept, maybe to some new, newer riders, but all part of the charm of these older super bikes. If you knew nothing about bikes and you were put on this bike and told to go for a ride, without knowing what it is, you wouldn't, the fact it's 25 years old, wouldn't even enter your head. It feels so modern, even today. So as I was saying, I really enjoy reviewing these like retro class super bikes. Back when this bike came out, the original Fireblade, the 9 Series Ducati, the 916, 996, 998. Um, I was still flying around on two stroke race replicas, fantasizing about what it would be like to buy one of these bigger bikes. So I've had my full bike license now for probably about 15, maybe 20 years. So I kind of missed this like golden era of the superbikes, late 90s, early 2000s. So it's really nice now to get the opportunity to go back and sort of relive that a little bit. Obviously you're in incredibly limited to what you can do on the road, but every so often you get just the opportunity to get, scratch the surface a little bit of what the bike can do. Honestly back in 1998 those early journalists who got the opportunity to ride the bike for the first time, must have just blown them away back then. And of course, we've got a, an awful lot to, to thank this version of the R14. I mean, the original Fireblade set the agenda.
Yeah, the likes to do catty, keeping them on the toes. And then the R1 came and just raised that bar completely. As I mentioned before, we're off the bike. It's uh, the stack gearbox, longer swing arm, reduced wheel span. All I is it's still implemented even today. Honestly, I know I keep saying it, but it's really hard to comprehend the fact that you're riding this bike as old as what it is. Everything just feels so precise and direct. So if you've been on the channel for a little while, you might have noticed that I'm sporting some new riding gear. Um, so basically I wanted something a little bit more practical with, obviously when I'm out filming, reviewing bikes. A one piece levers isn't the most practical thing to wear, you've got no pockets. Uh, you know, you're shooting in movement and so on. So I wanted something a little bit more casual. So I decided to give uh, Engine Hawk a dry well air jackets. Heard a lot of good things, a lot of hype about the brand. So we've got the Engine Hawks jacket. Also invested in a Rurok Atlas helmet. Um, so I will put a review of both of these on the channel once I've had a bit more of a chance to test them. I did opt for as well some uh, Revit. Cordona, Corduna jeans, um, so like Kevlar line jeans. Honestly, actually, I really impressed with them. They're so comfortable, and they come with I think knee and hip armor as well. I will still keep the one-piece levers for longer rides out, or obviously track days or anything like that. But for pottering around, for commuting, for filming, uh, it's much more practical this setup. I do also have a new camera that I've been using. So this is the Insta 360 1R. Again, first time testing it today, so. Once I've had a bit more opportunity to use it, there will be a review of that on the channel as well. But hopefully it should be a massive improvement on picture quality for you guys. An absolute pleasure, honestly. Really impressive. So I you can only imagine what it must have been like to ride it for the first time back in 1998. It's got a lovely sound to it as well. It's uh, obviously it's standard exhaust on the bike. But it sounds quite, uh, not sure what the word, mechanical is probably the best word. You can hear the engine sort of tatting away underneath you. And once you wind it on a little bit, you can hear all the induction under your chin. Just eats up these bends effortlessly. I know it's a little bit early on, particularly in town, it's a little bit of a handful. Um, I mean, especially on some of the roads that are covered in potholes and you... I wouldn't say you fight in the front end, but... It's not the easiest riding experience but as soon as you get moving or the road smooths out it just becomes a whole different experience a bike like this really makes a lot of sense if you maybe you're not going to use your bike all the time you know the joy of something like this is it can sit in the garage you'll never lose money on it it's only going to increase in value and should the time come and you're going out for a ride with your mates on a sunday even if they're on newer bigger bikes you're still going to keep up with them Say keep up with them, you might even give them a run for the money. I think uh, for a bike like this, especially on the track in the right hand, would wipe the floor with an amateur on a, a Panigale or a, something like that. Really impressive. Right, so as always when I'm reviewing bikes that aren't mine, I always consider it a huge privilege. I try and be very respectful of other bikes, I don't like to put a lot of miles on them. Uh, so we'll find somewhere a little bit quieter and pull over and before I take the bike back I will give you my closing thoughts, a little bit of a conclusion after spending the day with this bike. So today has been an absolute privilege to spend with such an iconic piece of machinery. Um, if you were to ride this bike without knowing what it is, you would never even consider the fact that this bike is almost 25 years old. The handling is so light, so sharp, um, but definitely to get the best from it it needs to be on the track. The state of some of the roads that we're blessed with here in the UK made um, a bit of a handful at times. The front end you found you were fighting it every so often. For that reason you will find that many um, original version R1s have had aftermarket steering dampers installed. It's funny because as soon as you get the bike on to a road of any type of quality um, it becomes a whole different riding experience and you get to feel a little bit of what the Yamaha R1 was built to do. The engine is phenomenal, um, you wind it on and it just pulls and pulls and pulls right the way up to the red line. Even by today's incredibly high standards, it's still a very impressive bike. 
Um, you can only imagine what it must have been like to ride one back in the late 90s when they were first released. If you're thinking of getting one of these original Spec R ones, uh, there is a few points that I would suggest you take a look at. Back in the day, this was one of the most stolen bikes, especially here in the UK. Um, so it is worth checking your engine numbers against the bike's documents. There was also an issue with the gearbox that you should be aware of. Um, so some bikes would develop a problem where they would jump from second gear to neutral while under load. Though to be honest, the bike would have probably had to have been abused to get to that point um, as the engine and gearbox uh, was fairly bulletproof. As long as it's been looked after, you shouldn't have any problems. But it would definitely be worth um, arranging a test ride just to make sure that that's not an issue on the bike that you're looking at. Other than that, in all honesty, go for it. Um, this is a classic bike in its own right and it still ticks all of the boxes even today. And if you need another excuse, um, consider it as a fantastic investment opportunity. Uh, these original spec R ones are only going to increase in value over the coming years. Thanks so much for watching my review of this iconic machine. Um, if you made it this far to the video, please do pop a like down below and consider subscribing to the channel. It really does help us out massively. Huge thank you again to JD Motors. Don't forget to go and check them out. Take care. I look forward to seeing you all in the next video.